There'll be another dry interlude sat at Sunday morning, particularly across eastern areas. So a good start to the day on Sunday, but it does quickly cloud over as this next area of rain pushes eastwards. It will be a briefer spell of rain and behind it, we'll see further dry weather arrive. We could also see some more dry weather developing by the middle of next week, but it will be an unsettled start to the week at least. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5am, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's News Channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. To join me, Nana Aquir, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday, where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Is it, well, it, you... It's on your teeth. It's on your teeth. I don't... I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Curse, on this Saturday Night Showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday Night Showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good evening, I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB Newsroom. The US has blocked calls for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. A United Nations Security Council resolution to demand a ceasefire in Gaza failed because it was vetoed by the US. There were 13 votes in favour, whilst Britain chose to abstain on the voting. The US is the only nation to vote against the ceasefire. Downing Street has rejected claims MPs were misled over the cost of the Rwanda scheme. That's after it emerged the asylum plan has reached £240 million before any flights have taken off. Ministers expect a further £50 million will be spent in the coming year. 
Rishi Sunak, who's facing division within his party over the policy, is hoping to rush emergency legislation through Parliament with the first vote on Tuesday. A man has been jailed for life with a minimum term of 20 years for stabbing two police officers in central London. Not from Great Wimble Street. Stay where you are. Get back. The Met Police has now released body cam footage of the attack. Mohammed Rahman stabbed PC Joseph Gerard in the neck and the chest and PC Alana Mulhall in the arm after a police pursuit in September last year. The 25-year-old was convicted of attempted murder and grievous bodily harm. A teenager has been arrested on suspicion of murdering a woman who was shot dead in East London. 42-year-old Leanne Gordon was killed in Hackney on Tuesday evening. She was one of three people found with gunshot wounds. A 20-year-old man and a 16-year-old boy were taken to hospital. Hollywood star Ryan O'Neill has died peacefully at the age of 82. The American actor is best known for his role in the critically acclaimed 1970s romance Love Story. His son, Patrick O'Neill, announced the news and wrote on social media that his father was a Hollywood legend full stop. And a funeral for the Pogues frontman Shane McGowan has been held in Ireland. Paying tribute to the singer, the band's hit Christmas track, Fairy Tale of New York, was sung during the service. Family, friends, politicians and celebrities filled St Mary of the Rosary Church in County Tipperary. Hollywood A-lister Johnny Depp was among those delivering a reading. And Shane McGowan's widow, Victoria Mary Clark, praised the singer. He really did live so close to the edge that he, he seemed like he was going to fall off many times. I mean, we've had me and Siobhan and all the family. We've kind of lived in terror, haven't we, for a very long time. But on the plus side, I think the, that exploration led to a kind of creativity which may not have been possible without the use of all these substances. This is GB News across the UK, on TV, in your car, on your digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying play GB News. Hello and welcome to Headliners, I'm Nick Dixon taking you through tomorrow's top stories for the next hour and I'm joined by the dream team, though it's some people's nightmare, Lewis Schaefer, there he is, looking stoical, and Paul Cox. It's me. It's, it's the classic double act, how are you lads? Yeah. It's always the dream team when I'm on it. Wow. Wow. Just thrown us both under no, the bus. Yeah. There's no Lewis Schaefer in team, Lewis. I thought the last one we did was very funny, mainly me, but if we're 40% as funny as that, we'll stay on the, the telly. Absolutely. Great feedback for the last show, Nick. You said you were rusty in the last show as well, which was a lie. I know. I'm just born to do it. All right. Well, after that excellent banter, let's have a look at the front pages. So the Times has PM's chance of Rwanda plan success 50% at best. The Telegraph, Jemrick, too many migrants to integrate. The Daily Express, get me out of here. Five million Brit Christmas getaway. No idea. The I, angry MPs plotting to derail MPs Rwanda law. The Mirror, Farage fakery row, a ludicrous story we'll be covering in a moment. And the Daily Star, missing 16 days to Christmas. And there's a Santa shortage. And those are your front pages. So we're going to start with The Telegraph, Lewis. Telegraph, big news in The Telegraph. Uh, Jenrick, too many migrants to immigrate. And the Jenrick <coughs> was the... What was, what was his Immigration job? officer. He uh, was the immigration officer, and he, he resigned because they... because they were keep, they keep on pushing the... Um, the whatchamacallit? The... Um, Rwanda. The Rwanda thing. And everybody knows it's not going to work. And it's, it's like... 
Well, what are they, what are they thinking, Rwanda? And um, and that, that's the news. So he wrote, this is how it works in this country, is a guy resigns, and he gets he gets an article in the Telegraph if he's a conservative, I guess maybe in The Guardian if he's a, a Labour person. Yes, right? you identified the key sides. Okay, the key <laughs> sides. It's taken a while. And then, and then, and then, and then he, he goes on to plant his flag for possibly campaign to be the uh, next Tory leader. Well, yeah, what's really interesting to me about this one, though, is that Jenrick came in as Team Rishi. He was Rishi's yeah. friend. He was Team Rishi on that side of the party. But he's become red-pilled by the sheer data behind immigration, just looking at it, dealing with it every day, the scale of the problem. He's gone, this is madness. We have to do more. And he's just saying this Rwanda deal is totally inadequate, Paul. Oh, and, and as it stands, it is. I mean, the, the, the thing about this story is it really tells us what the problem is. And the problem is that there are too many people coming into a country. Like any country, we have an infrastructure that only supports a critical mass of a certain number. Now, I don't know what that number is, but I'm pretty sure we've exceeded it now. And the more and more people start looking at this issue in depth, the more they realise something has to be done. And Robert Jenrick is just another one of these people, following Suella Braverman, who has said this needs to be done. And it's not going to be done. It's not going to be done under Rishi Sunak. I don't think there's anyone in power at the moment that could push this plan through. And... I'm not sure what's going to happen. One thing I do know is it's going to come the, probably the biggest talking point in the pre-election debate. Well, De Generic. Is that what not you're Generic. saying? Not Generic. Generic and Rwanda. Yeah. <laughs> Rwanda will, not Generic. But but he's, Ge he's got stuck on Rwanda, Rishi. Go on. But like you're saying, he's been red-pilled. Yeah. Because he's inside and he sees the numbers. Yeah. Everybody sees the numbers. We know 1.2 million. We see... Everybody knows exactly what's happening. Yeah. So but the other side wants to put their head in the sand. The other side of the Tories, where Generic saying, look, GP services and yeah. hospitals do not grow on trees. Integration is impossible if you let in over 1.2 million new people, as we have done in the last two years. Yeah. I mean, I know it sounds sensible to you and it's me, but that their the establishment in... don't want to see that. No, it's not that their head is in the sand. Is they're on Team World side? They actually half, want it. Half yeah, of yeah. the Tory party are they want mass immigration and they want the destruction of Britain as. The people know so it. I think Nick made a good point earlier on that's been slightly lost here is that Generic, yeah. it, the, the interesting thing about Generic is he was on uh, Rishi's side. He came into this relatively lukewarm about Rwanda, we can do this, but it'll have to, you know, let's not go too extreme. And, but he's seen the figures and gone, do you know what? We need to do something here, and nothing I'm seeing is going to make a difference. Yeah, he says it, well, the UK is beyond breaking point. He's talking about the indefensible and farcical situation of hotels full of asylum seekers, and he wanted an official cap on visas and immediate overhaul of the uh, ridiculous visa scheme. And he said uh, universities are in the business of migration rather than education. So it's incredibly scathing, as you say, from a former Sunak ally. So it's, it's brutal stuff. Rishi's in trouble. So let's do the Guardian, Paul. This is the Guardian. Home Office told reveal forecast of Rwanda plan. So, top civil servants summoned to give full and frank answers after cost of scheme rose from 140 million to 290 million. Which is... I mean, I don't know... I mean, it was 140 million the other day, then we were going to add 15 million because you got to add 15 million to help thing, help the system out. And all of a sudden now it's jumped up to 290 million. And I'm not being, I'm not surprised here that this, that people are being summoned. The fact that this is in the Guardian, they're not looking at this going, this system needs to be employed in some way. They're saying this is ridiculous, it's a system that could never work, come what may, and we spent far too much money on it. Which is difficult at the moment to disagree with. The reason it is, is because we need someone in power who's able to deliver this. The only way you can realise the benefits of that 290, let's call it 300 million quid, is to deliver deliver something like this and see it deliver the benefits. All the time we talk about it, it's an absolute nonsense. Yeah, and everyone's against it from all sides, the, the Guardian for different reasons, and it's the cost here. But it's, yeah, 290 million, and actually getting, actually deporting anyone could go up to 400 million. And it's saying 1,000 migrants to Rwanda could be 169 million, 169,000 per person, in contrast with 106 million to accommodate them in the UK. I'd still probably take it, because uh, just, you know what they're going to do. But that, that's me. What do you think, Liz? I think, uh, I think something needs to be done. The people out there are watching this thing, I don't know, I get so angry and strident and then people hate me. I'm a comedian, I'm not a political commentator. You've been but... cursed to talk about politics yes, on the telly. 
Yes, it really is a drag. <laughs> it's, 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 and the, the point is, is that first of all, yeah, he was, Genrek was Rishi. I'm going to go back to this. He was Rishi Sunak's <laughs> friend. The way politics work here is everybody's pretending to be everybody's friend. It's not like in America where somebody says, "I want to be president too." Just because you're president doesn't mean that I can't be president. Number one. Number two is is that something needs to be done, and it needs to be done in a forceful, strong way. And maybe when we're done with with the, uh, maybe when Israel is done with Gaza, they can come and help us. Out. <laughs> Didn't know where that was going, but go Quite on, go something on. there. Yeah, yeah, until the solution. All of a sudden, I thought, of course, our immigration solution lies in Israel. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, and it is That's the, his phrase. It is the end of the day, let's face it. Death of love, centralization yeah. of everything. <laughs> no, we need a deterrent, Nick. Yes. We don't have a deterrent. Rwanda is a deterrent. Yeah. I don't want to go to Rwanda. It would stop me getting in a dinghy. Yeah. We've tried Lewis at the border telling jokes. Yeah. It hasn't worked. <laughs> Let's do the mirror then, Lewis. What about this ludicrous story? The mirror. Story? The mirror. I'm a celebrity storm. Farage, who's our guy here. He's our I, guy. Have you met him? I don't know. I have. He, yeah. Very nice guy. It's so funny because he's here. I never said anything to him. I was afraid to say anything to him for fear he, that I would like him. He speaks highly of you, though. Does he really? No, he <laughs> hasn't mentioned you, but I'm sure Look he would. He, he, me. he didn't mention you, no, but, he, no, he, but I, he's I'm been, sure he would. We've seen each other. He hasn't met, a lot of people have mentioned He's me. seen you and just has chosen not to engage. <laughs> oh, why did you have to tell me that he was interested in me? <laughs> oh, it, was just, it was just a joke, but we'll talk about it after. We'll talk about it when we're not on live telly. How about that? Yeah. How was that acting? That's amazing. That's why I'm with John. It's good Davis. acting. I thought you were genuinely angry. It's so hard yeah. to tell. It's so hard to tell. Anyway, <laughs> for, it's Farage Fakery Row. Yes. Because The Mirror is a left wing publication, right? See, I'm learning got this it. stuff. You got it. You got it. It's a left wing publication. And they're basically saying that all the images around on the TV, on the internet, are all AI generated and they're all fake. So, in the end of the day, Sorry, I'll say it differently. Uh, after all the chickens have been plucked, it's just a, this is just an AI story. It's completely absurd because they, they, they've been sharing these pictures on the internet, and it's like Big Ben with a Farage flag, and Farage is not going to go out on another plane and do a flag. Yeah. We know that, and it's like a bus with Farage on the side. We know they're not real. It's one of these absurd <laughs> stories that pretends to think that we think they're real, and this is made onto the front of a national newspaper. Any adult human knows they're not. Any child knows they're not real above the age of two, and they've said that. embarrassingly people have found the original photos, showing them without the added posters. We know it's called a meme. Paul, <laughs> yeah. help me. I'm yeah. there, I mean, there are two words in here that make sense. One is Farage and one is fakery. The other one is row. There is no row. There's no there is row. No, there is Except no now, because I'm so angry. There is yeah. no room in London or Australia or anywhere in the world where people are rowing over this. Because, as you say, of course this is happening. There are two things going on with Nigel. First of all, in the mirror, don't like this bit whatsoever. He's a very char charismatic man who is going to endear himself to people, endear himself to the public, and is doing well as a result of that. And there are also people out there that would love him to see well. They don't give a damn about I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. But they know the people it will upset, i.e. the mirror and their, and their fanatics, yeah. if he does well. And that's exactly what's happening. And they're just, I mean, they're basically just getting wound up each night in the paper yeah. and showing us their... It's their truly comments. fake news. There was one uh, image of Farage with, like, a, a Brexit, like, medallion It says Brexit. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, These are not real, guys. These are jokes. <laughs> the mirror, absolute new lows for the mirror. All right, well, let's see if the star have anything more sensible, Paul. It's big news, actually. Yeah. Uh, finally, uh, we're going to discuss this. Well, we, haven't, we haven't discussed this enough, actually. 16 days to go to Christmas, and there is a Santa shortage. There is, there is a Santa shortage. Millions of Santas have left a whole ho hole. Yeah. I'm reading from the paper. This is not the stuff I've written. In the, fe in the festive economy, when they decided to hang out their boots during COVID-19. Let's hope they did decide to hang out their boots and COVID-19 didn't take them away. Uh, but the shortage is still being felt years later. I'm not sure exactly that that's true. I think it's very difficult in this climate to openly admit you want to be a Santa Claus. Uh, if, you know, the, the guy who comes to a, a shopping centre and says, hey, can, uh, can I work with the children? I'm not sure we oh, want I see him your to. Point. I was surprised. I thought this is one job that a straight white man can still get. Well, is Santa. No? I have I have actually been, been Santa. For okay, so you don't have to be straight. And, and no, <laughs> no. And I'll tell you something. It's not that easy as you think. You get to see that you come into a room, you're filled with kids, and you're just filled with hatred for them. And you've got to see. <laughs> you might be in the wrong job, Lou. You're the sort of crusty well, the clown of Santa. 
sounded like a great guy. It sounded like an actor comedy <laughs> job. And then, and then this is, oh my God, kids, and you got to, oh, 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 and you can't be. It's like being with Paul. You got to be like happy every <laughs> single. You don't even believe in Christmas, do you? I mean, you know. I, I do you're now not. because they hate the Jews less than other groups. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you're okay. Wow. Yeah. I wish I'd seen you with the kids explaining <laughs> oh, that. That would have been brilliant. To the kids. I hate kids, but yeah. at least you don't hate the Jews. Did, I mean, did Nigel just, Farage <laughs> actually say something? He didn't, Lewis, but well, it was a little joke. We'll talk about it after. I'm so sorry I've confused you. I've got your hopes up. <laughs> we'll find out more about me and Lewis and Nigel Farage in part two, but that is it for part one. But coming up, Lord Frost has a warning for the Tories, and our friend Nigel Farage destroys Boris Johnson in a poll. See you in two minutes. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. So join me, Nana a Queer, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Is it, is it, is you? <laughs> it's on your teeth. It's on your teeth. I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. Can you survive? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. Welcome back to Headliners. I'm Nick Dixon, still here with my legal team, Schaefer and Cox. That is Lewis Schaefer <laughs> and Paul Cox. There, there's Lewis. There's Paul. Look at him. Looks great. And let's do the independent. And Lord Frost has the radical idea that the Tories should actually try to win the next election, Lewis. Yeah, this is Lord Frost urges Tory MPs to replace Rishi Sunak or face electoral car crash. And this is a, this is a story of uh, Brexit secretary... And this is uh, Nick Dixon's best friend. And um, we're constantly hearing about... Uh, yeah, he's about... a big fan of the Weekly Skeptic podcast, and yes. he's been on my other podcast, The Current Thing. Good so, guy. So Two you... podcasts, Nick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not too neutral on this story, so I'll just be quiet. Yeah, and uh, I'm totally neutral. He says, he says, let's get rid of Rishi Sunak, which is... This is what happens. First, Jenrick says it. First, Suella Braverman. Basically, the, the, the ship is sinking. Let's, let's, jump, let's jump out of the ship. That's what this is all about. And so this guy is saying, we just got to get rid of uh, uh, Rishi Sunak and get somebody else in. It's not going to help because the party is completely... It's 50% corrupted by horrible world team people. Who yeah. Get... 
All right, well, to be very fair to Lord Frost, though, let's be fair. Let's look at some of the things he said. He said that they, they only have two thirds of their 2019 voters saying they'd vote Tory again. He's saying that the left, uh, centre left of the party, which Rishi now must be a part of, he believes, because of his recent reshuffle, uh, are happy with losing decently. And there does seem to be an element of that. You know, they're happy just to keep the establishment going. Maybe it's time for Labour, that kind of vibe. What do you think, Paul? Yeah, it's a bit defeatist, and, uh, and, and that's the trouble. There are people on the, on the right of the Tories that are looking at this going, we are going to get devastated in any any general election if we carry on going. I said this earlier, Rwanda is going to become one of the biggest debating points. Rwanda and immigration could become one of the biggest debating points in the lead up to the general election. And this is the only thing I think that the Tories can yeah. really reshape the general election vote on, and it's immigration. And there is a lot of talk, loads of rhetoric around about the Rwanda policy being extreme, and it's a fair assessment. It is extreme, but it's extreme for an extreme problem. Like, you know, Chemotherapy is extreme, but it works. Uh, but the, the trouble is, in order for this to work, it needs someone who actually believes in it behind it, like Suella Braverman, um, maybe the king of the jungle, Nigel Farage, I don't know. But I think the reason that people like David, Sir David Frost are looking at this going, do you know what, if we don't do something quick and now, we are going to get absolutely smashed. I think they've got a good point, because getting absolutely smashed is not good for the Tories. Yeah, and, and a few things he, he said more specifically, he said we can't keep talking about the smoking ban and A-levels, which Rishi did at the conference. <laughs> yeah. We need to talk about tax, spending, culture wars, net zero, migration, public spending reform and more. And uh, pu public service reform, sorry. And What's quite honourable about what he's doing, he's saying it's not good enough just to accept defeat or to get too tactical, as some people are doing, and say, OK, we'll take the hit here. And maybe even I could see that argument. Take the hit now, the party regroups, you get someone like a Farage or a Suella, and then, then you come back later. But, but Frost is doing the honourable thing of saying, no, no, it's our duty to do everything we can now no, to no, win, no. even if that means getting rid of Rishi as no. a hint. No, this is, this is, it is smoke and mirrors, because it isn't about winning. It isn't about saying the right thing. It isn't about coming up with the right policies. It's about a structural change to the Tory party, where the Tory party divides into the losers that are team world and the winners that, that are going to stand for Britain. And it, there's, there's no... There's no place for Rishi Sunak in the thing. There's no place for changing policies. It's There's the death place. of the Tories. It's I, the death. It you, is the death. You started of the by Tories. saying no, 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 but I think you were kind of agreeing. Maybe you mm -hmm. weren't agreeing with Frost, but you were you were agreeing with me at least. I don't know. I'm not sure what you were saying. No, I. I just, <laughs> no, a lot of those things. A lot of those things. There's a and not whether I would agree with. There are people out there who would agree with those things that they maybe would vote for those things, but they're not voting for a thing. They want somebody who stands. For them for and Britain. stands for Britain. Absolutely. Well, that part is true. Let's is quickly, that right? Yes, absolutely. Let's do the Express with a poll on which GB news presenter should be the next Tory leader poll, basically. Boris Johnson's shock as XPM beaten by a surprising candidate in the next Tory leader poll. I don't think it's that surprising. The Express asked readers on who they thought should follow Rishi Sunak, assuming he goes, he's not gone anywhere yet, um, as head of the Conservatives. Nigel Farage topped the poll on who their readers thought the next Tory leader should be with Suella coming in second and Boris coming in third. I don't think there's any surprise there. Um, perhaps there's a slight, a slight surprise that Boris is in the top three because I think it's very unlikely. Although it's much more likely that Boris Johnson is going to be the next PM if Rishi was to go than Nigel Farage. Unless by winning the... I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. The prize is to become Prime Minister. Mm. I'm not sure what the route is, because A, he's not a member of the Tory party, yeah. so he can't just, he can't, they can't, can't just put Nigel Farage in there. Connie, yeah. it sounds like you need to interrupt. Well, no, I don't have to interrupt, but I just was so keen to say something. That, that, that Nigel Farage has tried to change the system, but now the system is <laughs> going to change yeah. for Nigel Farage. Mm. This is my claim. I'm yeah. the first person to say it. It's an iconic mm. moment, because that's what's going to happen. There's such a demand for him. Now, admittedly, this is the Express, so let's be honest, but yeah. there is such a demand for Farage yeah. that I believe somehow, to quote Jurassic Park, Life finds a way. Not Somehow so. it will happen. There is a way. He gets he gets parachuted into the House of Lords, and then he becomes the leader. The leader. You don't have to be the leader of the. Um, no, you can't you be don't a lord. Have to be an MP. You can be a lord. Am I right about this? How do I know more about you than you guys? No, I'm not, he I, could I, do well, that. I'm not saying that can't happen. But I, I think he can get into the Tories legitimately as well. They're just welcoming in. If, if we looked at the recent yeah. conference, that was the vibe. But or he is, does it with reform. But let's see. But this is exactly what I said. Is I said the the Tories are. <laughs> clamoring for someone who's going to fight for the home team. Yeah. Like in America, that song, let's root, root, root for the home team. Someone is clamoring. And who is that person? That person is Nigel Farage. Who, who is the second biggest vote-getter? Suella, Suella Braverman. Braverman. So together, the two of them are 60... 
four percent of the vote, I think. So yeah, that's the Farage answer. got forty-one percent. Sweller twenty-two percent. Boris was only on fourteen. Yeah, home team. Yeah. I it's think. incredible. A root, root, root for the home team. That is yeah. such an American. So team. American. So boring. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we yeah. don't support the home team. We don't support home the team. We don't thing. support Portsmouth. I think we need to let. Let's move on. The one thing we all agree on: yeah. Farage is inevitable. Let's yes. do the Times. And it seems Keir Starmer's popularity doesn't extend to everyone, Lewis. No, it doesn't. Two charged after Keir Starmer's mobbed by Gaza protesters. And this is up in Glasgow at the Crown Plaza Hotel, which is a nice hotel. I stayed in the Newcastle one. And it was, it was quite nice. £295 a night for a regular hotel room, which is quite a lot of money. Anyway, he was surrounded <laughs> by protesters shout, shouting child, uh, child killers. I didn't see the video. Paul told me about it. But it says that they he was... Uh, the, future prime minister, it was meant to feel uncomfortable. And uh, so they arrested somebody. Was it justified that he that they should arrest somebody just because they were shouting child killer at the guy? Well, this is the question. I, I saw one video where they're kind of accosting him, and it does look quite bad. But there was also that video on the train where the guy fairly politely puts his point to him. And this is the question, Paul. Should you be able to go up to a, a Keir Starmer, a big politician, on a train? They, look, they didn't deal with it that well. They shuffled the guy out immediately, and they said, where's the transport police? There's an argument that you should be able to speak to your representatives. Now, the other argument is yeah. people are getting killed, so David Ames and... People, the same guy visited Michael Gove's house six times. It's, it's very dangerous. And Joe Cox, house. of course. Joe Cox, so, yeah. Um, and, of course, because of those things, I think there are boundaries. We're all, we're all for free, free speech here. We're all for protest and people being able to uh, express their views. However, there has to be boundaries to that. I did, you know, I'm, I'm no Keir Starmer fan, but they were in his face. He did look distressed by it. And I think, uh, you know, I, I challenge anyone not to be somewhat distressed in that situation. So jumping out in front of people, um, feeling like you're out of control of the situation, I don't think that's right. I think that actually there has to be some boundaries in place. And, you know, the, you, you can protest, you can write letters, you can write emails, you can pretend to be a different account on Twitter. Oh. And, or you can or, or do whatever Lewis does at the weekend. No. But you can... But, but you don't have to shout in their face. Yeah, okay. no. No, well, he's wrong. He's uh, wrong. Is he...? He, Very quickly, totally, why is he wrong? He, he's totally wrong because we've been on we've been on GB News fighting for the rights that people say whatever they want to say, even if it bothers people. So yes, he was bothered. The threat, should be, it's the threat that bothers no, me. He, there was no threat made. You should be able to go up to anybody on any train, no matter whether they're prime minister or not, and say to them, you know what, I think you've done a bad job. And and if if there's a threat of violence, that's one thing. If it's not a threat, then you don't. You, I, Okay, but it was a tricky line. But we've been very fair. We've been very balanced on that. And to be fair to Starmer, it would have been a very boring debate to have to have on a train. You're trying to eat your meal and you're going on about Israel-Palestine. But, but anyway, we're going to move on to The Guardian and some fairly complicated legal wrangling between the UK government and Scotland. But the bottom line is we win, Paul. Yeah, that's, that's all that matters here. Uh, I think the headline is England... In the, in the Guardian, it says England win. It doesn't, actually. Uh, Scottish court rules UK government veto of gender recognition bill was un was lawful. Yes, of course it was. Downing Street's unprecedented veto of Holyrood's contentious gender recognition reform bill was lawful. Scotland's highest court ruled. So this is really interesting. Because it's really interesting for a number of reasons. Let's just park the fact that the, the whole policy is actually bananas for a moment. But Scotland have only got limited... Um, uh, devolved powers. And you can argue that that's not such a good thing, but as they do in here, because the Scottish Government's Social Justice Secretary, Shirley Ann Somerville, said devolution is fundamentally flawed in the UK if the UK Government is able to override democratic wishes of the Scottish Parliament, they did vote for this, uh, and veto laws at the stroke of a pen. However, this alone proves why there are only devolved. We are the United Kingdom. They are one third of that part of the United Kingdom. If you're going to make laws so ridiculous that anybody can uh, identify as, as they wish in any time period whatsoever, mm. that is naturally going to affect the other nations within the United Kingdom. So it's right, I believe, that it's been overruled and it's right that they can overrule. OK, well, good. you made a good case for it. What was quite funny to me is that Hamza Youssef uh, said that this is why we need independence. Funny how everything ends with that, you know, yeah, yeah. with that hammer, everything looks like independence. Well, it was funny because one of the newspapers said he was humiliated. I always love reading that in the papers of this country. The guy was humiliated. He wasn't humiliated, he was happy. It was like a, a win for him that, they, that he's been overruled. And I love her. I love Yami Hummus. 
Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yummy hummus. <laughs> what is his name? <laughs> Hums are you, sir, did you mean? Hums are you, sir. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good job. I, I, I don't even know if Nick should apologise there. That was a mistake. No, I think it was a joke. I think it was a joke. That was a funny joke. I think it was a joke. Yeah, I think it's okay. <laughs> but maybe we'll end on that. Uh, okay, that is it for part two. But coming up, Joey Barton goes in two footed on women's football, and Elon Musk goes in on Disney. See you in a minute. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, we're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 till 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's News Channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Welcome back to Headliners. Let's get straight into it with The Sun. And Joey Barton is in hot water for telling the truth about women's football, Paul. Yeah, interesting Just story. <laughs> this. Lol. Um, yeah. <laughs> shameless, shameless Joey Barton goads Laura Woods and Bianca Westwood, uh, who, by the way, are ex-women uh, footballers who are now pundits, amid storm over sexist remarks about female footy pundits. So this was on Thursday, and the former Newcastle and Man City star launched a tirade against female pundits and co-commentators working in the men's game. Now, I don't normally stand up for Joey Barton. Uh, Nick and I, we're, we're, we're football fans. He's not the sort of guy who endears himself to anybody at all. <laughs> so, so I'm not surprised that he's got involved in this. However, I want to clarify this story because he was arguing about their experience and qualification for the jobs that they had. So obviously, in men's, men's football is the peak of football. Um, I think we can all agree on that. And, and as such, uh, Joey Barton's kind of saying he believes the very best of the very best should be the co-commentators co and the pundits on this. And his argument is there are women in the game that are very good, uh, like the Chelsea manager, for instance, he picked her out and said she is very good and, and she knows her apples. But he's saying that some of the other women involved 
don't. Mm. And that they are in position, not because they are women, but because there are these box ticking exercises yeah. going on. I suppose that is one inevitable problem with identity politics. You end up, even if someone has made it legitimately, you end up with that question in people's minds. That's the unfortunate thing about it. And yeah, he does, but he may be right. He does phrase things perhaps not ideally, although he calls people who take issue with his comments eunuchs, which is quite amusing. <laughs> and, um, but it, it's this thing about the things being forced on the viewer, I suppose. We've had BLM forced on us in the football, the yeah. rainbow badges, the rainbow laces, which some people don't appreciate. And are women pundits and commentators part of the same thing? What do you think, Lewis? Do you watch football, soccer? I love football. Soccer. I love football, my team. And, uh, and you know, soccer... What's your team? Just football. Whatever team you want. I support football. <laughs> <laughs> and when I found out that Portsmouth is owned by Americans, I thought, well, yeah. that's great. It's another one. Um, the, the point is, is that there was this debate over whether you should have non-football player commentators in the box, people who we were just... We could do it. Yeah, just anybody to be there who knew something about it. And I think this is the same thing when they let women do it. They've never been on a, on a football pitch with other men, and they haven't played the professional game. The truth is, this story, the reason this gets... They've played the professional game, but not the men's game. Not the men's game, which is the, which is the number... And, and I, love, I love football. But the truth is, is that women are always trying to be involved in men's world. <laughs> And they're always, and you know, cool. you know what was said. You know, was going. Go you know what was said. It was said that the most interesting thing in a woman's life is men. <laughs> they, who are they? So are these men? Lewis, I was a bit worried about this one, but you've impressed me. You've said something much worse than Joey Barton, <laughs> and, and you're right to, because otherwise he'll tweet and call us eunuchs. And yeah. he does I'd have love some a tweet. Tweets. I'd love, I would love a tweet from Joey Barton. I mean. Uh, to be fair, and to add some balance to this, I'm probably the only person here that has actually in the past said anything positive about women's football. I quite like it. And some of the women pundits, some of the women pundits are very good. I mean, I don't watch football for the pundits. I watch football to prove to my dad that I'm not gay. But... Uh, uh, <laughs> Is that working? <laughs> no, it's not. I'm not gay, Dad. All right, well, let's see. you've somehow said something worse than Joey Bart as well, so we'll end there. But it's really exciting to think you put hashtag Kaizen at the end of one of them, which is a Japanese business strategy, so you never know what he's going to do next. Let's have a look at the Times, and you can now go to the cinema to watch people shout at each other about politics. I can't believe people would watch something like that, Lewis. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, polls, polls grab the popcorn as politics hits the big screen. And this is something amazing that in Poland, which is a, a separate country somewhere over there, um, is streaming the parliament into theaters in mm. Poland. And uh, this is all new. No other country has ever broadcast the, you know, their, the politics. Why can't they just stream it on a telly? Why can't they just stick it on the telly? Why, do go why, to don't, a why don't you just listen to me? It seemed like you'd finished, because <laughs> you were going so slowly. It, you seemed, would... like, it seemed like you slipped know, into a coma. Because, but... because the was, subtlety of his comedy. I was hoping to come up with something more interesting than that. What I'm saying is, is it's broadcast on TV here, it's broadcast on TV in America, probably dozens of countries, they broadcast Parliament. And this has, like, made the times, it made the news. Well, it's been a shock in Poland, because they said they were going to do it, people laughed at them, and when they did it, they're now selling tickets to the cinema. I don't know what's going on in Poland that is so uninteresting yeah. that they've got to... Do you know what's on tonight? Parliamentary debate on... Uh... Um, whatever. Let's go. First yeah. date. Imagine the first date. Yeah. I can't decide if it's good that people are engaged in politics or terrible that politics is infringing upon every aspect of life. So now it's the only thing people want to watch in the cinema because yeah. all the films are ruined by politics. Polish politics. Or, or, or that Poland actually thinks they're doing something new and refreshing when it's been doing done around the world. That's right. how out of it, it hasn't. Poland. They don't know because they haven't got the internet yet. Yeah. All right, let's do The Guardian. And Elon Musk says Lewis Schaefer should be fired immediately. Sorry, I mean the CEO of <laughs> Disney should be Does fired immediately. Immediately. Yeah. yeah, I don't know who put that on there. Paul, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Too. Elon Musk has said that Disney chief executive Bob Iger should be fired immediately after the world's biggest entertainment company joined an advertising boycott of his platform X. So what he actually said was that Walt Disney would be turning in his grave uh, over what Bob has done to his company. Now, I thought that uh, Walt Disney was cryogenically frozen. That's a uh, folklore, isn't it? So you're right, so it's the wrong metaphor. Yeah, so yeah. His head would be... He, yeah, exactly. Weeping. And by the way, if Walt Disney comes back to life, it, that's going to top the top the bad year for the Jewish people, isn't it? <laughs> it, it, it <laughs> I mean, you know, they have had a rough old run. If all of a sudden in December, Walt Disney springs up, explain why that is. The people don't. Well, know uh, Walt, Walt Disney, he's a um, famous anti-Semite. I don't know how famous. Yeah, he is quite famous, and he's that's why you said it. That's what made it a joke. Yeah, yeah I don't like to explain the joke because then it's no, not so funny. You've got Lewis for. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, I would say this, however. Mm -hmm. um, Elon Musk is proving himself to be 
a real legend. Uh -huh. You know, depending on what side of the argument on, you might not agree with me. However, if you stand up, there, there has never been anyone who's been able to stand up to the most richest people in the world because yeah. there has never been anyone as rich as Elon Musk. And we're no. just lucky that he's on the side of free speech. We are Absolutely. Lucky. And can I just, sorry, sorry, just quickly give the crucial context The Guardian completely miss out of this story, which is that... The uh, Disney have been advertising on Meta platforms, Facebook and Instagram, and they are being sued by, by New Mexico, Meta are, for enabling child sexual abuse material. So what Musk is highlighting is the hypocrisy that Disney has boycotted from X, but will still advertise on Meta, yeah, which yeah. he's saying is much, much worse. That's yeah. completely omitted from the story, so I just wanted yeah. to say that. Good, but good the, big, the big story is, is that Disney is Team World. They sell all over the world. They did Mulan in China. These are ev these are evil people. It's not the Disney that we used to know. And and he's right to boycott them. That just like we need to boycott Sainsburys. Sainsburys. Because they boycotted GB. Because they're boy because they're boycotting us. We got the same stuff going on. Elon Musk is the greatest. I mean, I don't know whether he's an anti-Semite. Doesn't strike me. He's probably an anti-Semite because the fact is everybody is. But <laughs> the, the is that is that he's this Twitter thing is interesting if you it's interesting and it'd be a sad day that we do not have twitter it will be i'm not totally sure if we're allowed to tell people to boycott saints but that's just lewis's satirical opinion to then but, just say do not yeah, boycott Sainsbury. exactly don't boycott them unless you some people want to and i don't know anyway <laughs> as you say they're not the disney we used to know like that song let's do the i and controversy about israel stripping stripping prisoners lewis very serious story yes it is serious and i'm going to try to be as serious as i can be here israel degrading degrading quote unquote stripping of prisoners a war crime says human rights group and this is in the iNews. And uh, there's a picture taken of, uh, of prisoners who've been basically naked, but they're not totally naked, they're wearing their, their underpants, in a field by the Israeli uh, military. And there's been a lot of complaints uh, saying it's, it's a crime and cruel. It's worse than multiple rapes. It's worse than child murder. It's worse than kidnapping. But we don't know, we don't know if those women, if those men... Some of them are women. Maybe they, maybe they identify as women, these Palestinian Hamas soldiers. Maybe, they, maybe some of them might be fat, and they might not want to be photographed. And I saw a picture of them, and I was, like, really surprised. You'd think they'd be in good shape, but they're fat. And maybe some of them are, like, overly hairy, you know, a, a battle between the Jews. <laughs> Between yeah. the Jews Where is this going? and the Palestinians. I mean, you're talking about two of the hairiest people on earth. Well, yeah, somebody, I mean, Hamza Youssef, who we just talked about, has described it as inhuman cruelty, but to give the pro-Israel side, and basically I asked Josh, he's point, <laughs> they will point out that they could be suicide bombers, so that's one reason to take their clothes. They could be civilian, they look like civilians, so you don't even know who's, who's in uniform, who's not, so you don't know who is actually Hamas. And, the, of course, Hamas treated people much worse, you could say, on October 7th. I mean, you'd either be dead or you'd be treated much worse, and this is just a fairly standard way of taking prisoners. I don't know. What do you think, Paul? Well, we're reading this in the eye, so, of course, we're getting the pro-Palestine, pro-Gaza view of the world through the eye here, yeah. and they've chosen to admit the fact that it's purported that a lot of these men are, were part of that uh, uh, 7th of October raping and pillaging that uh, you so articulate... Uh, so well articulated a moment ago, Lewis. And because of that, that adds some, some adds a lot of context and some justification. One thing I would say, however, is that in order to win a war like this, you've got to win the political war as well. And in order to win the political war, you've got to be seen to be morally better. Yeah, that is true. And unfortunately, the optics of this show that... It, that might not be the case. OK, no. I think we, so we've got to move on. Sorry, Lewis. But I think, Sorry, no. I think we're going to do one story very, very quickly. And you know you've gone too far when you're cancelled by a bird of prey rehabilitation charity. Who was doing this one? Paul, I think it's Yeah, you. I'm doing this one. Bird Charity breaks ties with Chris Packham because an outspoken broadcaster was becoming too political and saying people should consider breaking the law. So this is TV presenter Chris Packham, which many of us know, particularly if you grew up in this country, and has lost a role with uh, a bird of prey rehabilitation charity known as uh, Raptor Rescue yeah. and um, for being too political, essentially. And, yeah. But he still, he still maintains his role as vice president of the RSPB, Wildlife Trust, the Butterfly Conservation fly conservation. He's not yeah, really yeah. lost out And here. Channel 4. Anyway, uh, and why are they releasing raptors? They, they, they wreaked havoc in Jurassic Park. <laughs> yeah. So sorry, Luce, we've got to end on that. But that is part three in the bag. But coming up in the final section, woke free beer and silver snorters. See you in a minute.
I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> I'm not sure. To join me, Nana Aquir, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday, where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Is it, it, you... <laughs> it's my new teeth. your new teeth. I, I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. <laughs> Welcome back to Headliners. Let's get straight into it with the mail and the rise of silver snorters, Lewis. Yes, troubling rise in, of silver snorters. Treatment for over 60s, okay? <laughs> users <laughs> has shot up in the last year. So it was built for you. Yeah, yeah. it is. You're I don't, silver, you're snorting. I don't take drugs. I sell them. <laughs> you've got to have morals. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not gonna, you don't use your own product. Anyway, it's, this basically is in Daily Mail. It says that more and more people are using drugs as they get older. Of course they're using drugs as they get older. Why wouldn't you? Drugs are needed for old people. But it's, it's not that many drugs. It's not, in, in 1920, 19, 2022, only 517 people over the age of 60, which is me, were caught in the hospital for using coke. I can't believe you're that old. Is it all the drugs? It, it's the fact that... Uh, that you sell. It's all that money you make. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do I, look, do I look young to you? Yeah. I don't feel it. You, you, look, you look younger than, than whatever you just said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've always been surprised. I think it's maybe more your young personality. I'm 66. Paul, is this broken Britain? Is this a really sad story, or is, the only is it good like Lewis the, says? The, the older generation are the only people who can afford the drugs. I mean, they're... Good point. They've got triple... Got all the property. Just, yeah. Triple locked and ready to party. You know, they're basically... They're, they've got their... <laughs> they've got their... Got their someone's going to meme that on our Twitter now. They've got their... That's their, a T-shirt. <laughs> triple locked. That's a calendar. That's a whole calendar. <laughs> Lucy, lock. Lucy, triple locked and ready to party. <laughs> they are, literally, their pension is safe. They're up and so, and right. so's their night. They never take their house away from them. Uh, they're inter it's interesting. It seems like they're goading them. It, it feels like you know they're saying cocaine users in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, 80s. Goodness sake, uh, might not be used to the potency of the drug that, as it was because it's much more stronger now. It's like they, we're talking to these people that were there in the day, yeah, right really back in the bad. day, and. Got the youngsters going, this stuff's too strong, and they're like, let me find out for you. Yeah, exactly. And you know what? It's another one of these ads in the newspaper just pushing the drugs. That's yep. all they do. It makes and you're reading it, and you think to yourself, oh, there are old people doing drugs. Why can't I? I should be able to 
to do it. Very bad, Daily Mail. It is bad. You know what's good, though, is it gave us that joke from Paul, which I'm not <laughs> going to try and talk. Let's see the Metro. A McDonald's could use new technology to make their food hot and fresh. That sounds radical, Paul. <laughs> Palatable yeah. food. Yeah. <laughs> it's not what I need, I'm telling you. McDonald's could soon use AI to keep food hotter and fresher. Yeah. So McDonald's claims it will roll out the latest artificial intelligence technology across its chains next year, promising hotter, fresher food as a result. Which, which makes me worry about what I've been promising up till now, because yeah. that's the very minimum I expect from anyone selling food. Can, but it's the last thing I need, isn't it? Can I just say something? It's Paul hasn't read the article, because this is such a non-story. It's a combination of non- and AI is non-story. It didn't say what McDonald's was going to do with it. It just says we're going to use AI, mm. they, maybe I'm going to say, listen, watch me. I'm going to, I'm going to show tomorrow. I'm going to be using AI to be, to be funnier. But it, but it's not the suspicious part that they're tight-lipped on how they plan to use it, and they, yeah. they're not saying yet they'll sack anyone, but they totally will sack everyone. Oh, of course. Yeah. But Elon Musk has already told us that there'll be no need for anyone to work within, you know, but three weeks. But it doesn't weeks. say how they're going to use. Okay. AI. What I'm worried about is McDonald's is always cold, Riley, but I've just moved to nearer one, so I can potentially. I've just realised now, especially with AI, order just endless hot burgers every night. It's not good for me. Let's do the Daily Star, and I'm incredibly reluctant to give this story to you, Lewis, because it involves a calendar. It does. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Women of the U.S. pose with guns for a woke-free beer firm anti-Bud Light calendar. Is there a picture of this? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. But I'm. You thank would you think for, that there would be a picture of this? Sorry, no, we don't have one. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Under the bus. Anyway, ultra-light beer. It's some beer in America, and they got a poster. They got a campaign calendar with all hot conservative chips, chicks. Ch and your chips, whatever. <laughs> you, you see, your, your mind's on food. Your mind's on carbs, Lewis. <laughs> yeah. You haven't eaten a carb since 82. And, uh, and uh, the awkwardness is I gave away my last calendar, but you can still order it. The one time it the was relevant. The one time. <laughs> <laughs> didn't the perfect have it with time. I wouldn't have even minded if you brought it out <laughs> yeah, and you exactly. don't have it. Because it's yeah. selling so well. It's selling really well. We've had to order it three different times. It's selling like hot and McDonald's. Go to the website, Lewis Schaefer. Go to Lewis Schaefer on Twitter, Lewis Schaefer.co.uk, Lucy Harmon. D designed okay. it. Friend of the show. Anything on this? Well, I mean, it's a great marketing opportunity. It's people like Riley Gaines. She's very cool. Ashley St. Clair. It's an obvious marketing opportunity. They're selling it for £25. Right. But Lewis Schaefer's calendar is only £15.99. Okay. Paul, was that... I thought I asked you, but... <laughs> yeah. Anything very I mean, briefly? It, it's very... It's a very interesting name. Ultra Right, it's called. The beer's not ultra light. It's ultra right. I mean, oh, I yeah. like, so, so you're six cans in yeah. and you start sort of chasing immigrants and checking for genitals. I thought I, I thought about having a show called Nick Dixon's Always Right. Yeah. I'm pitching that now live on GB. Write in if you think... Yeah, I should That's have actually a, a good show. idea because you've you got a, such an attitude. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. It's a pun. All right, yeah. let's do the... <laughs> you, you took the negative out of it. Let's yeah. do the Times now, telling us that having lots of children leads to an earlier death. Just the kind of story we need to fix our disastrously low birth rate yeah, for. Exactly. Genes behind having lots of children linked to earlier death. But very, very tenuously, as I'm about to tell you, a study has found that genes that nudge people towards having more children also tend to push them towards an earlier death. The effects of, on lifespan were small compared to environmental factors like lifestyle, but the findings may offer support to one theory of ageing. I don't think it does at all. I mean, mm. Josh Howie, major part of this show, he's got five children. And, you know, I, did, mm. I saw him reading yeah. this he's story. He's only got weeks to live. Though. He's just panicking. <laughs> he's, just, he's actually left. He was producing and he just went. He said, I've got to go around and spend my last moments with my millions of children. Well, this story is just your typical, not even your typical, it's quite unusual. It's the lengths that the times will go to s tell people that if you have children, you're going to die. One more reason not to have children. It's another death of love story. The Times is part of teamwork world. They don't want us to have children. They don't want us to have happy families. Very sad ending, but that's where we've got to end the show. Good fun, apart from that downbeat ending. <laughs> so let's have a quick look at Saturday's front pages. So the Times has PM's chance of Rwanda plan success, 50% at best. The Telegraph, Jemmick, too many migrants to integrate. The Daily Express, get me out of here, 5 million Brits, Xmas getaway. The I weekend, angry MPs plotting to derail PM's Rwanda law. The Mirror has Farage fakery row, which is an absurd story we covered earlier. The Daily Star missing 16 days to Christmas. And there's a Santa shortage. And those are your front pages. That is all we have time for. Thanks to my guests, Lewis Schaefer and Paul Cox. We're back tomorrow. Look, order my, order my yeah. calendar. Order, order calendar. the calendar. <laughs> Lewis Schaefer. And if you're watching at 5 a.m., then stay tuned for breakfast. But for now, it's good night, good morning, and God bless. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather.
on GB News. Hello, welcome to your latest GB News weather update from the Met Office. There'll be heavy rain for many areas of the country throughout Saturday. It'll turn quite windy through the afternoon, but there'll also be some sunshine later on and some drier interludes as the weekend progresses. Throughout the course of the night will be between weather fronts. That means there will be some dry weather around, particularly for central areas, the Midlands, parts of East Anglia as well, seeing some good dry, clear spells throughout the night. That dry weather then will push northwards, so some respite spreading north through throughout the night, but also some very heavy rain, rain arriving into the far southwest. With a southerly breeze across the country, another mild night, but it will be a very wet start to the weekend, particularly across southern areas where there's already a lot of water on the roads, as well as Northern Ireland and parts of Scotland too, where we've had a lot of rain already this week. By the afternoon and by lunchtime, it does clear up from the west. And so there will be some sunshine in the afternoon, but the winds do pick up. And there is a wind warning in force. We could see gusts in excess of 60 miles per hour, particularly across Irish Sea coasts throughout the course of Saturday afternoon. There'll be another dry interlude Saturday, Sunday morning, particularly across eastern areas. So a good start to the day on Sunday, but it does quickly cloud over as this next area of rain pushes eastwards. It will be a briefer spell of rain and behind it, we'll see further dry weather arrive. We could also see some more dry weather developing by the middle of next week, but it will be an unsettled start to the week at least. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5am, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's News Channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus tested, pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9 30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel.
Welcome to Lee Anderson's Real World, and tonight I'm joined by trade unionist Andy McDonald, journalist and author Harriet Sargent, the former editor of Labour List, that's Peter Edwards, he's on the show. We're going to go back in the day with former international England footballer Paul Parker, and I'll also be joined by Nadia Essex, who's a dating expert. But first, let's go to the news. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB newsroom. Downing Street has rejected claims MPs were misled over the cost of the Rwanda scheme. That's after it emerged the asylum plan has reached £240 million before any flights have taken off. Ministers expect a further £50 million will be spent in the coming year. Rishi Sunak, who's facing division within his party over the policy, is hoping to rush emergency legislation through Parliament, with the first vote on Tuesday. A man has been jailed for life with a minimum term of 20 years for stabbing two police officers in central London. The Met Police... Wait, we're more straight. Stay where you are. Get back. The Met Police has now released body cam footage of the attack. Mohammed Rahman stabbed PC Joseph Gerard in the neck and chest and PC Alana Mulhal in the arm after a police pursuit in September last year. The 25-year-old was convicted of attempted murder and grievous bodily harm. A teenager has been arrested on suspicion of murdering a woman who was shot dead in East London. 42-year-old Leanne Gordon was killed in Hackney on Tuesday evening. She was one of three people who was found with gunshot wounds. A 20-year-old man and a 16-year-old boy were taken to hospital. Prince Harry has lost a legal challenge in a libel claim against the publisher of The Mail on Sunday. It means the case must go to trial. The Duke of Sussex is suing Associated Newspapers Limited over an article about his legal challenge against the Home Office following changes to his security arrangements. His lawyers say the story was an attack on his integrity and would undermine his charity work. Associated Newspapers Limited argues it expressed honest opinion and caused no serious harm to Prince Harry's reputation. A gender reform ruling has been described as a dark day for devolution by Scotland's First Minister. Scotland's highest civil court found the government acted lawfully by blocking the controversial bill. The legislation, which makes it easier for people to change their legally recognised sex, received cross-party support in Holyrood. Humza Youssef says the judgment confirms that devolution is fundamentally flawed. A funeral for the Pogues frontman Shane McGowan has been held in Ireland. Paying tribute to the singer, the band's hit Christmas track, Fairy Tale of New York, was sung during the service. Family, friends, politicians, and celebrities filled St. Mary of the Rosary Church in County Tipperary. Hollywood A-lister Johnny Depp was among those delivering a reading. Giving a eulogy, his sister Siobhan said that while they were born in Kent, her brother's veins ran deep with Irish blood. And his widow, Victoria Mary Clark, also spoke. He really did live so close to the edge that he, he seemed like he was going to fall off many times. I mean, we've had me and Siobhan and all the family. We've kind of lived in terror, haven't we, for a very long time. But on the plus side, I think the... That exploration led to a kind of creativity which may not have been possible without the use of all these substances. This is GB News across the UK, on TV, in your car, on your digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying play GB News. And now it's back to Lee Anderson's Real World. Welcome to Lee Anderson's Real World, and tonight I'm joined by Andy McDonald. He's a trade unionist, and actually we've got a, a change this week. We've got the right in the corner. That's <laughs> author Harriet Sargent. Welcome to the show for the first time, Harriet. We're going to get straight to it. Um, Christmas is coming up. Strikes in the NHS, Andy. Strikes on on the on the railway system. Isn't it time now that they just put the strikes to one side over the Christmas period 
and let people get on with their lives and let people have that hospital treatment that they so badly need? Oh, no, no, I, I don't think so. I think, you know, I think the government need to offer a good deal to as left. You know, the train drivers union and you know, the conditions and the pay increase that they're going after isn't unreasonable. Uh, Mark Harp has just been operating in bad faith for the last what, year, year and a bit. It's just been, it's been poor from the government. It's time yeah. for them to step up. What would you say to train drivers, uh, to, to the members of the public, Andy, who's earning 25, 30 grand a year that can't get to that relative at Christmas, can't get to that important hospital appointment because train drivers earning 60, 70, 80 grand a year want more money. It's not just about money in fairness, it's about conditions, it's okay. about uh, contracts uh, and it's about pensions. Yeah. You know, it's not just about uh, you know what's in their pocket at the end of the day, but they do deserve a pay rise. They haven't had a pay rise in about, I think, seven years. They've lost 12% yeah. proportionally. It's poor. They need, <laughs> you know, they deserve it. Let me go to our right in the corner, Harriet. I mean, Andy's saying that they, they've not had a pay rise for so many years. They, they deserve it. You don't see many train drivers leaving the profession to go for another job. No, not at all. In fact, the opposite. I mean, I think there is an argument for saying, yes, you've got to pay people more if you have a shortage, like we had with lorry drivers. So, you know, they got an increase and they got their conditions improved. And lo and behold, we don't have a shortage of lorry drivers anymore. But that's not true of train drivers. The train operating company says every time they advertise a job, being a train driver is so popular, they get 300 people applying for just one job. And if they advertise in the North, 750 wow. people apply for just one job. And they have to close the application after one or two days. So there is absolutely no argument for a rise for train drivers when so many people want to be a train driver. And I happen to know this. I became interested in this because at the moment, I'm helping two young men who are just coming out of prison. And both of them are really eager of all the things that they can do. They want to go and work on the trains. Yeah. And they're former drug dealers, so they know a good deal when they see it. About transport. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Andy, I think Harriet makes a... A good point there that for every vacancy driving a train in the north especially, 750 people are applying for these roles. That sort of casts uh, into, into doubt your, your theory that it's about pensions, pay, conditions. Why are so many people applying for these jobs when they're so poorly paid? And got so well, we're not saying that they're poorly paid. It's just they haven't had a fair pay increase for a while. But, you know, you look at how many people apply to be MPs, how many people apply to be on those shortlists, how many people run for Parliament, but MPs get a pay increase every single year. No, they don't. Yes, they do. No, they don't. They we, have for the last seven years. They've no, had they a pay haven't. increase. No, yes, they, they have. No, they haven't, Andy. We yes, went they a have. Year. We went a year without a pay rise. But you went a year, year without a pay rise. Oh, yeah, well, you just said every year, so get your facts straight. So Andy. you took one year off. Yeah, and I always give my pay rise away to good causes well, that's in the local community. Well, Congratulations. But, uh, you know, the, a lot of those MPs don't. Yeah. Does Mark Harper? Well, he's on, what, 120 grand with his I think the last pay rise was about 2 or 3%. And I know there's not much sympathy out there for, for members of well, Parliament. Well, they'd be asking for two, if you gave 2 or 3% every year, mm. you know, you wouldn't have an accumulative 12% figure. Yeah, where's the twelve percent come from? Uh, the twelve percent—it's the accumulative figure. I think, I think Harriet. Can I, I just say something more about this? This—I mean, you, um, Angie raised the point about pensions and conditions, yeah. but we see the same there as with everything else to do with the trains. I mean, train drivers have an amazing—I mean, they are the aristocracy of pensions. Yeah. They have sort of gold-plated singing and dancing. You know, That's goes up with inflation. Are they better than bankers' pensions. Mm? Are they better than bankers' pensions? Barristers' pensions? Uh, well, I'm talking about train drivers. The you're other saying they're thing, the gold standard okay, of pensions. All right, if you so bring they're up, the sorry, standard, if they're you, the gold standard in the train industry, what compares? Sorry, cleaners? you're bringing up solicitor. You're bringing up a barrister. Okay, well then look at a solicitor. I mean, train drivers are actually paid five thousand pounds more than solicitors. Well, that's they not are true. There isn't, a standard, there isn't a standard nurses, wage for solicitors. No, they are compared to nurses, uh, for example. Nurse who's a ward nurse gets about thirty-one thousand pounds a year. A train driver average wage is fifty-four thousand. That means that people get a lot more than the fifty-four. I think, well, I think under the Tory rule, uh, no, I would advocate yeah, for, yeah, 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 for an yeah, yeah, increase yeah, for nurses no, as well. Also, can I just say the training? The training as well. I mean, nurses are doing three years worth of training. Yeah. They're having to deal with incredibly stressful situations, life and death situations on the wards. Train drivers do six to nine months, and then they're sitting in this sort of 
cosy cabin completely sort of insulated from the from the public. There's a big difference there, aren't you? She, I mean, Harriet's right what she says. The people working in the NHS like nurses. They do a hell of a lot of training, a lot yeah. of new degrees now, three, four, maybe five years. Some go into to specialist jobs in nursing. It's and you very, still wouldn't give them a pay rise. It's very you know, they, that's why the NHS is still striking. Very intense, very intense uh, career progression. But, you know, no disrespect to training drivers because they do a cracking job, they do yeah. a brilliant job, uh, a stressful job sometimes, but six to nine months training and they're on 50, 60, 70 grand a year. Yeah, well, I would I would agree that nurses do deserve to be paid more. I agree with you. You know, there's, there's no disagreement there. Yep, absolutely. Harriet, illness is not seasonal and there will be a lot of people over the festive period wanting to get to that important, vital hospital appointment to get that treatment uh, or that care that they need. Isn't it time, like we just said previously with, with the with the train strikes, that you know there's a bit of common sense used because they will lose public sympathy very quickly, some of the NHS workers, if they're striking over Christmas and you know vulnerable people can't get to the hospital to have that important treatment that they need. I, I mean I think it's appalling. You're talking about the NHS yeah. strikes. No, I mean it's absolutely heartbreaking. I mean, there are people literally dying on waiting lists. There are huge numbers of people who can't work, who are sort of sitting around yeah. in pain and agony on waiting lists. And this strike is just going to exacerbate all of that. So it's completely heartbreaking. Are they being scrooged, the health unions? I think it's more the Department of Health than anyone. You know, it goes back to that responsibility of them to offer a fair deal. Yeah. They just won't negotiate. They won't negotiate in good faith. Yeah. It's, it's poor from the government. They need to do better. It's, it's their fault. Uh, these strikes have been going on, what, uh, almost a year now, just over a year. It's poor from them. They, they need to do better. So you're saying it's the government's fault that people decide to take strike action? It's the government's fault when they don't offer fair contracts, yes. Okay, okay. When they don't offer fair pay increases to those on the front lines. You know, it's, an, it's a government establishment. It's yeah. part of the British yeah. identity, the National yeah. Health Service. I'm sure you're as proud of it as I am. I am you know, proud of it. You know, we I need to pay think, their staff I don't fairly. know what Harriet thinks, but I actually think the NHS gets enough money. I think it wastes a lot of money. We see some of the trusts now advertising ridiculous diversity roles, paying 60, 70, 80, even 100 grand a year. Surely that money should be used to go back into nurses' pay packets, Harriet. Yeah, well, I spent uh, about a year investigating the NHS, meaning I was in about six different hospitals, shadowing staff, everybody from porters to uh, sort of CEOs, and sitting in on meetings, uh, following nurses around, and I, I was pretty appalled by it, actually. I did that in six different hospitals around the country, and I saw a lot of suffering by patients. Yep. I saw managers... Well, I didn't see managers. Yeah. That's the whole point. I mean, as the porters told me, and they're very, very interesting on what's actually going on in a hospital, you never see managers. And when I did go and see the managers, they were always in a separate block, uh, usually modern, pristine, and they never seemed to come anywhere near the hospital. They were always managing to the centre, to the central demands, which had nothing, they had no idea what was going on in that hospital and nothing to do with what was happening. Harry, uh, a, a fair point. Paulie run, yeah, NHS. Yeah, 13 years of Tory Britain, what more can you expect? Yeah, the government don't run the NHS. And well, they delegate. The trust. They, the trust do, they do set the precedent. The, I mean, if the government the said fire all the diversity staff, so what the improved, trust would what fire improved, the diversity staff. Obviously, Harry has been there first time. She's, she's seen mm, the ways sure. first time. She's seen... Sometimes the, the treatment of the patients is not up to scratch. And, and managers, out-of-touch managers, in my opinion, yeah. sat in an office block a million miles away, haven't got a clue about the health service. Mm. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think they sh a lot of those should be fired. It's like civil service, a lot of that middle oh, management there we go. should be so fired. A trade union man now saying people should be sacked from the NHS. That's great, Thank Andy. Thanks, <laughs> Harriet. Look, do not go away, because coming up after the break, we've got legendary former England and Man United footballer Paul Parker. We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News.
Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. So join me, Nana Aquir, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Is it, 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 you? <laughs> it's on your teeth. It's on your teeth. It's, I, don't... I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Lee Anderson's Real World. I'm going back in the day now with a bit of a legend here, Paul. Paul Parker, former England player and QPR and Manchester United. I want to ask you, Paul, straight away, what was it like when you got the call to go and play for Manchester United? Well, it was one of shock, to be perfectly honest. I was actually sitting there with the, um, the late Terry Venables in a hotel in London on the verge of signing for Tottenham. Yep. And I was just sitting there that afternoon and... Um, the then um, solicitor of Manchester United, Morris Watkins, made a phone call to my agent and and that they asked me to come up on that Saturday. Terry Venables actually said, to be fair to him, um, you've got to go. You've got to talk to a club, you can't be rude. You've got to go and speak to them. Well, and I kind of went, right. I kind of looked a bit because I thought I was going to stay in London. And I felt really, you know, I felt guilty. He said, but... One thing now, and I kind of went, oh, what's that? He goes, I bet you don't come back. And he was absolutely correct. <laughs> I didn't. So what sort of sales pitch, if you like, did Sir Alex give you to go there? He walked me around the ground and just telling me all different bits around the ground, who's, you know, telling me the kind of famous people who's in what seats they sat in, um, how much each stand's held. Yeah. Um, I asked a question, why there's so many cars parked out front? Is, was there a game on or something? He goes, no, people just visit in the ground. Mm. Why? Mm. I said. And he said, well, we got a museum. I kind of went, a museum? And I just didn't, I couldn't believe they had yeah. a museum. And, he's, and then all of a sudden a pile of people just come into the stands, the now Sir Alex Ferguson stand, and they all sat down and there's someone at the front who was just talking to them. And it was just amazing to see that, you know, coming from Fulham and NQPR, and just seeing that amount of people just coming to look around yeah, the grounds, yeah. and it was just something I'd never witnessed before. In my but life. Tottenham Oxford at that time, oh. that, I suppose, is that when Glenn Hoddle was playing for Tottenham? Um, no, this was um, '91. This was oh, so. Um, it was Terry. Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, it was right. Terry Venables, and but this was a good side, Tottenham uh, at that time, yeah. wasn't it? Was, was Gaza playing at that time? Yes, Gaza would have been there. Yeah. When you fancy played with him at club level? I would have said without a doubt after you know spending those weeks good, bad or indifferent with him during a World Cup. <laughs> but to play with Gascoigne could have added, you know, given, you know, a little bit more kudos yeah. to me as a player. 
but the opportunity to go and play for Manchester, just arriving there, seeing the size of the stadium, the amount of people who were just there walking around, mm. it's it's just one of those opportunities that you couldn't say no to. I mean, you'd have been back in the day, Paul, you've been on a decent wage, obviously, playing yeah. for these football teams, but you see some of the wages that the, the young players are earning these days. Basically, at 18 now, they can sign a contract to make them a millionaire mm. and they'll be secure for the rest of their life. Do they lose a bit then, some, some of the young players? I think human nature says that you lose a bit of your edge. There isn't many who can actually get through it and carry on pre that it's, it's almost impossible to do that because you get that little you get that comfort zone so it is wrong in a way for them to be given that amount of money but to get them but they should give it in a different way yeah. it's, it's about keeping them hungry because that's what keeps keeps you in football keeps you is surviving. there enough protection for young people like mentors and buddies but you know when these young people sign on because it's I mean, for an 18 year old to be on this sort of money it's like it's mind blowing. I would have thought that you know the club should wrap their arms around them a little bit. Have a, I know Fergie was quite strict in the day, weren't he, with his young players? Mm. So, but I don't see so much of that these days. Paul. Well, we don't hear so much of it. Sir Alex done it, and people talked about it because of those young players were in, were there in the um in the, in the foresight of everybody. But I look at it in today, and the best people who can be in that position to look after these young players yeah. are their parents or their close friends. Clubs couldn't offer, yeah. but are you going to listen to a stranger or are you going to listen to someone close to you who's actually telling you the, maybe the home truths about life unless, you know, if you don't do it the right way? Now, you've played in some big games, mm. massive games, semi-final World Cup 1990, won quite a few trophies with Man United. Could you sleep before a big game? No, never. Never? Never even. We used to have sometimes go to ho go away you know, stay overnight and then wake up in the morning, go for walks, and then you've got a whole day waiting for a game. Yeah. I think you try and sleep and you're... Sometimes I think I played the game. Yeah. That not, you know, what was playing later on, it was in my head. Of, it's almost... Some people will say they did, but the ones who the ones who actually did it, it's very, very minimal. I think it's yeah. impossible to so sleep. So then you've, you've, you've had a sleepless night, you've gone and won a big match, won a trophy, a, a Premier League or yeah. a, a FA Cup or something like that. And then, how long does that buzz last after? I said, probably don't sleep the following night. Oh, I think you do. The more yeah. so the other when you haven't got that in front of you, especially when you've been successful as well. You, you know, you get it out of the way. Let's put it this way, it's always difficult to lose a big game yeah. for Manchester United. And then it's difficult to sleep that night knowing that, you know, there's people around that that game meant so much to, say, losing a Manchester got derby you. Got you. or losing to Liverpool, which yeah. is... <laughs> Which is always going to be hard if you if you're a Manchester United fan. I, I'm glad you said that because we always hear about the famous hairdryer treatment. Mm. Did you ever get that from from Fergie? Oh, I got a few. I've got a few from him. Yeah, yeah. With, without a doubt. There isn't many who got away with it. I can only name one during my time who always got away with it, and that would be Eric. Yeah. Eric always got away with it. Yeah. But um, I think we'd have to say, given what Eric done in that time, I think. As players, one of the players who played with him would accept that. He cut him a bit of slack as well, didn't he? Especially during the, the Kung Fu kick era as well. Um, mm. I think most players would have been out, out the door, wouldn't they, for that? Yeah, I think, I think it was a little bit more slacker than slack, to be honest. <laughs> you know, he knew it, he, the boss knew it was wrong. The yeah. boss tried to tell him after the game, but the manner in which the boss actually told him made a lot of us laugh. Yeah. But um, <laughs> what did he say to him? He just virtually just after telling everyone else what they'd done wrong, ripping yeah. into him, seriously ripping into him, he just virtually said to Eric, "You can't do that, son." And I thought he might have been a little bit more heavy than that, but we all just looked at each other and <laughs> we just all started laughing. Yeah, so and then it and then it went more serious about it after. But his talent, <clears throat> you couldn't let talent like that go. If it's not, there's a chance to keep it, you keep it and. The boss was proved right in keeping him. He was proved right. I suppose there's a bit of a trade-off there, isn't there? His, his yeah. behaviour or whatever, some of the antics he got up to against. He was a brilliant footballer. Yeah, but it's what he done after Eric as well that made sure, I'm sure, made the boss feel even better. You know, what he'd done with, he had to do community service and yeah. there was kids were coming into the cliff training ground mm. and it was easy for Eric just to stand around and let other people do the coaching. Yeah. But he didn't, he joined in and he made a point of speaking to every single kid over a, a, a fair number of weeks. So we've got the, we've got the Euros next year and then mm. in, in a couple of years after that we've got the World Cup. I think, Paul, that the, the current batch, no disrespect to your generation, of, of young England players are absolutely brilliant. Mm. I think they're probably the best batch of talented players we've had uh, in, in a long time. Are we going to win something, finally? Well, I mean, you said it there, we have got a decent set of um, 
young players. We've got a decent set of players. We've got a manager who's been to a semi-final and a mm. final. So it'll be our most experienced manager going into another tournament. But what we've got as well is we have to remember is that the Euros um, is not a strong tournament anymore. Yeah. I always used to say that the Euros was the most difficult to win because <clears throat> all the, the best sides in the world, the majority come from Europe. Yeah. Now Europe is quite poor, to be honest. That's why we get poor qualifying now. The qualifiers are awful to, for the Euros now. They're, yeah. they're not worth being in. Really. So I want you to pick two players out now, Paul. Uh, one from domestic football and one from international football. The two mm. best players you've ever played against and why? Played against? Yeah. Um, if I was to going to go at club level, I mean, there's so many players I've played against, but I've always got to mention Paul Gascoigne in one, you know, yeah. in, I have to mention him, just what a talent he was. And it's just a shame that he never, he couldn't keep it going. Yeah. And, you know, but then you look at George Best, someone like yeah. that, you know, those kind of players, they don't seem to be around for 10, 15, 20 years, do mm. that at that level. They yeah. seem to just peak and that's it. And yeah. Paul's one of them, definitely. On the, um, on the international side, I... On Europe and everything, I have to say one of them, which is an, another great player, but injuries curtailed his career, was Paolo, Paolo Futre, okay. the Portuguese yeah. player. Played against him at Atletico Madrid. Um, he did come to England, he came to West Ham, but his, his knees were shot by yeah. then. But he was a wonderful player. But they're players, you know, he was a player that not many people would know about, but he was a seriously good player. Well, you had a brilliant career, Paul. Um, I think most young men watching this would give the right arm to, to do what you've done. I know. That's if I can remember. You know what, I'm one of those people, well, of course they can remember you. I mean, <laughs> I'm one of those people that um, still has dreams about scoring a winning goal in the cup final. Uh, and then you wake up and you realise that you're 50-odd and you've got no chance. But it's been a pleasure, mate. Thank you, Lee. Cheers, Paul. Yeah. Look, do not go away. Coming up next, we've got right versus left. Do not go away. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5am, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie tonight, 9 till 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's News Channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
tired of the usual focus tested pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Joining me now, we've got the former Labour List editor, that's Peter Edwards. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the show. And again, we've got Harriet here, Harriet Sargent, journalist, author, and uh, just generally nice, decent person. Oh. Look, <laughs> this week, Labour leader, mm. Mr Starmer, made a comment about Maggie Thatcher. He sort of come out in support of some of the things that Margaret did back in the 80s and, and 90s, Peter. Do you think he was right to do so? Well, Keir Starmer came out in support of strong leaders, which I think is what anyone who wants to be Prime Minister should do. And he cited Blair, Clement Attlee yeah. and Thatcher. So, of course, some people on the left were concerned by that. But Britain has a lot of problems. If you're standing to be Prime Minister, it's right that you... Um, Sight people have a vision. And of course, we on the left disagree enormously with Thatcher, particularly over things like um, employment rights, industrial relations, uh, deindustrialisation of the North, 